going to talk about an elk hunt. The last elk hunt that I and my two sons made together. I believe it's been 19 years ago. And we took 10 head of horses and mules into the mountains. That means we had seven animals to pack. Well, we packed, you know, the animals with a fairly light pack. We were going in 20 some odd miles into some remote country, bordering Yellowstone Park. We had to pick our way, we had to pick our way several miles beyond the trail into a very private sort of a basin where there was good feed for our animals. It was down, it was down protected quite a bit out of the wind. And that was quite important because the country was full of charred burr trees from the 1988 Yellowstone fires that advanced into the Joshone Forest and just absolutely opened up, opened up the forest floor that was filled with trees and those dead a lot of those dead snags are standing and you describe these dead trees as widow makers you had to pay attention when you're traveling you had to pay attention where you're going to camp you had to pay attention where you might have tied a horse or mule to make sure that it was solid it wasn't going to tip over and kill your animals or kill yourself or both. And we set up a big tent. There was a big meadow, deep, deep grass, deeper than grass was above our knees. Going in for the duration, however long it took to be able to, to be able to kill to be able to kill elk and always quite a lot of elk in this area and the elk hunting was just absolutely fantastic you could have your pick pretty much of of a bull anywhere from a little three four three or four point uh, young bull elk to smaller fives and sixes and big six or seven point bulls and there were three of us. We split up. I went by myself. And Landon and Flint went together. And they went in just a little bit different direction than I did, but we were headed in the mostly end up in about the same direction. And it didn't take very long, and I hear. I hear a few shots and I knew, you know, that we were in that country by ourselves and, oh well, they probably got a couple of elk. Well, it got to be the latter part of the morning and I caught up with where they were and they had, Landon had a big six point bull down and they pretty much had a goodly share of it taken care of and the elk kind of were in their direction, but I didn't see, I didn't see any elk. And I thought, well, if I'm going to get an elk, I'm going to have to do something. So, I left them to tend to that, to that elk getting it all butchered up and whatnot and loaded and so forth. And I walked maybe 300 yards or something like that. And here come several elk. And there was a young, a young five-point bull. Very would be very good eating. That was my chance because the previous shooting had blown the few elk that out about 15 of them that were in the area there. And so I was just at the right at the right place at the right time, and I, I killed the elk. And anyway. Have to pack that back into back into camp and so forth so go back and pick up pick up horses and be able to pack it in and you know 
I stayed I stayed where all the where the meat was and whatnot so we wouldn't have a grizzly problem and they went and retrieved a number of horses to be able to pack out these couple of elk and we got them into camp and pulled in there the first day and the next day was the opening we got right in on the opening day and killed these elk on opening morning now Flint he could have killed an elk and he could have killed a really good bull but he passed he passed up the elk he wanted something even better than what he saw so now we got two elk. The day is is wearing on. So Flint's kind of a kind of a daredevil, and he climbed a couple of trees and got up in a couple of couple of big dead sound trees there, about a hundred yards from camp, and were able to ho hoist a hoist a tree up into the tree and be able to anchor it down and get a meat couple of meat poles there high up off the ground. Now these were, you know, pushing about 20 feet up off the ground because a big bear can stand on its hind legs and reach up in there about damn near 10 feet. So got these, got these meat poles all prepared there and to be able to use for years to come and whatnot. And, and then we had to be able to hoist these, you know, with the rope and the block and tackle get all this meat up up in the tree for the night and of course when you got it up there it's got to be out on the on the pole it can't be near the tree it needs to be out at least at least four feet from the tree so that if a bear gets up a tree if a bear gets up the tree and starts trying to grab at it he's not going to knock it down and ruin your day and not have the meat that you that you you know are going to bring home feed you for the year but anyway we got that we got that all taken care of and and we decided that you know then morning flint was going to hunt and landon and i would get things pretty well gathered up and be packing packing all this stuff up you see because we decided that the the best thing to do since we had two elk which was going to use up the horses that we brought and the horses that we needed to be able to pack our equipment out that we were going to you know do that and maybe a flint killed an elk you know we still had it to where we had a way to be able to pack that elk out but he he didn't find an elk and so we all basically come home but basically in the night a storm come in storm come in and it snowed and this almost always happened in that high country you know up there around 8,500, 9,000 feet or so you know hunting and it was snowed the whole day all the way back to, you know the 20 some odd miles back to the back to the truck and kind of a wet sloppy snow you know but anyway that's one of our latest, you know, situations where the three of us, you know, were able to be together, were able to be together, and just only a few, just only a year or two after that, I rode into that country by myself, not exactly by myself, but, you know, riding a mule and, and a, had a pack horse and had a, had a, had a dog with me, one of my one of my red red bone hounds and anyway you know <laughs> that was a that was another situation you know I went in to scout you know to, to be able to hunt and see what there was for elk and there was plenty of elk in there and I made sure that the elk didn't see me or anything in that country and so we thought we were all set to go in there and when we did finally go in there a few weeks later when the season about 10 days later damn wolves had moved in and run all the damn elk out of there and we spent a number of days in there i believe three days in there and came out the fourth day because the elk were driven out of there by the damn wolves and that was the end of going back into that back country because the great numbers of wolves just totally ruined the hunting it just went 
from one year to excellent hunting to the next year, terrible, nothing. But anyway, this, this young dog, this young dog that I had, Huckleberry, to get into that country, there were switchbacks. You go up this way and then you switch back this way and you switch back that way and then you go a ways and switch back again. And of course coming out, you know, you're going back and forth on these switchbacks and and there was a place or two on those switchbacks that it was only a short distance over to the other switchback and I'd cut across, I'd cut across on the switchback and Ben had become, Ben had be headed east and all of a sudden, Huckleberry. I mean, Huckleberry, be, we'd be headed east and Huckleberry, of course, was following and then I'd drop off and he'd stand there, wonder why I didn't go west there and come back on the switchback. He was just standing there just befuddled. I, was, <laughs> I had him all messed up because he kind of got in the rhythm of going up and down the switchbacks. Dad's lost. And he thought I was lost, I think. But anyway, it was just so comical. It would have been kind of precious to have a video of it. But anyway, you see, this is what's happened. Yeah, we've hunted, hunted a few times you know, ourselves or a time or two together, Landon and I have, you know, been in the back country hunting, hunting elk and one thing or another. And, but anyway, taking the most outstanding hunting in the whole world and just a matter of just a short period of time, just losing that wonderful experience. Got the wonderful experience of the mountains, but that's not, that's not, that's not all of it. That's part of it. The rest of it is the hunt and everything that goes in in on it, and the the finale of the hunt when you get to find the animal and be able to kill it and bring it home, you know. And this is what I've enjoyed so much. And one of the things that I've enjoyed so much is is packing those those elk out on the mules or horses. A lot of times, when I was by, by myself, I'd butcher an elk all out by myself and load it all myself and only have two animals, a riding animal and a pack animal, and pack the elk on those two animals and lead my, lead my mule or my horse out of the mountains. And when I did, I'd either had a 480 Ruger in the shoulder holster or a rifle over my shoulder because I'm packing meat, and if we bump into a bear, it could get kind of ugly. So you never, you never travel ever, and you never do anything without being, being fully aware and fully armed in this backcountry. Because this bear situation has got completely out of hand and completely out of control, and you know, luckily we haven't had to, we haven't had to do anything along that line but it's come it's come close it's come close to have to do something but this is this is part of part of what's happened to our hunting and especially in these past 15 years or so there's even been more and more hunters that seem to show up and the bad thing about it is is the unethical aspects of everything that's going on but I described to you here, you know, packing into the mountains and walking and and walking up these elk and killing an elk. This is real hunting. This is real hunting. Packing it and doing everything that there is, it takes up a tremendous amount of your energy. But the enjoyment and the the you know, it really does something for your soul. But what I see is that we've got a crowd now that have absolutely no ethics. They've never experienced anything like this. And they think that all they got to do is buy a rifle from some outfit that claims a thousand yards right out of the box. People will never be hunters. They want to start target practicing on our game, wounding our game destroying the every aspect of hunting because they'll never ever be hunters 
These people that are doing these things, they are not hunters. They don't know how to hunt. They don't understand. And the worst part of it is, they don't care. They just don't give a damn. And it's gotten to be many, many times worse. And this isn't just isolated to this part of the country. This is all over the country and other parts of the world. Going with a group of people, maybe five or six people, and starting to bang away at a herd of 150 head elk and wounding a couple of head elk and never recovering anything, that is not hunting. This is nothing but slob activity at the very, at the very, very best. That's just nothing but slobs. This is what I see going on. I see things where not only just rifle hunting, but archery hunting, people killing things late in the day and never going to recover it. Oh, I'll go tomorrow. Well, it's spoiled. I don't care where it is. It's spoiled. They're evidently not interested in the meat. They're evidently don't have any respect for the majestic animal. They got to have their picture taken. They got to have their picture taken in the great big smile. Look what I do. And I got a, you know, I got a 176 inch ram or a 380 inch bull elk, you know. It wasn't about anything to do with the hunt. It was about, look at me, look at me, you see, sort of thing. And I've got a few pictures, not very many, of things, you know, that I've shot over a lifetime because it hasn't been the main focus. The main focus with me is the enjoyment of everything that there is to do with the hunt and the enjoyment of bringing it out and taking care of everything and the companionship of the animals, companionship of a friend or family or whatever. This is just disappearing. Some of these things are disappearing. And in some instances, it's never going to come back and you'll never see it again. And, you know, this is, this is what I see. I have an old friend. He'll be 90 years old this year. And, you know, for a number of years, for a number of years, he can't hunt anymore because he just can't get around. But that's what he, what he did. He was gun nut. Did a lot of shooting, reloading, hand loading, knew what he was doing, but he remarks that I'm glad that I was able to do it. Well, I was able to do it, but you know, I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it probably gone in my days, is what he says. What he says to me, well, he probably is. It's just about all gone, and for the most part. As far as in hunting aspect, it's gone for him because he can't get around to do it. He can he can still shoot, but that's about all that he can do. He couldn't handle, you know, taking care of animals if he if he was if he was to do so, somebody'd have to take care of it and so forth. But and these are the things that I see coming because of of my experiences and my age. Every year we're all getting older, and I don't know, I don't know what in the world that there's, I don't think there's going to be hardly anything in a lot of instances for the generations that are coming up. Just my sons have seen that, you know, they're both, they're both in their 40s, and they've both seen the world-class hunting that we had, and they've seen it just go right go completely the other direction and anyway you know they're young enough have enough energy and ability to do some of these things but they know you know it's very very sad it's very very sad but it's even it's even more sad for dad because dad has saw many 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 more times the outstanding hunting aspects out there you see, they're not they're they're probably not gonna ever be able to experience that. They've experienced a lot, but because of things are, are just disappearing at such a fast rate to do with the unethical aspects and the no care attitude, 
not to just to do with the hunters, the outfitters, our game departments. There's a lot of in a lot of people involved with this that just don't give a damn.